I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me this morning to the book of 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 30. I want you to find your place here. This is a very helpful message. It's something that God has touched my heart with and tendered my heart for today. 2 Chronicles 30. We're looking at God's work through King Hezekiah and how God has blessed him. Fifteen years the house of the Lord had been shut down and God put in his heart to open it up and the people rallied. They worked together and God blessed them in a wonderful way. And now they were rejoicing again in the Lord. And he sent out an invitation uh, just from Dan to Beersheba, just from the northernmost part to the southernmost part of the nation of Israel for people to come from all over to celebrate and to keep the Passover again. A reminder of how God had delivered them from Egyptian bondage and how that is a picture we know of Christ and how He would be our Passover lamb and how His blood would be applied to us and that way we would find deliverance in Him. When I see the blood I will pass over you. And so there were those, many who came, there were those who didn't even some who hesitated and delayed. There were those who scoffed and even mocked. They laughed at such a thing. That reminds us all that not everyone has a heart for God. Not everyone will celebrate the work of God. Don't be daunted by those who do not. Don't be discouraged by them. Don't be in any way sidetracked because not everyone gets on board with what God is doing and they celebrate and rejoice with you. You have a heart for God, keep going for God. God will honor you and God will bless you. The Bible even says in the last part of verse 10, you can see it there, there were those who laughed them to scorn and mocked them. Nevertheless, divers, that means many of Asher and Manasseh and Zebulun, humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Also in Judah the hand of God was to give them one heart to do the commandment of the king and of the princes by the word of the Lord. And they assembled themselves together there. The Passover was kept. It's amazing as this unfolds itself. Uh, the king prayed in the last part of verse 18 and said, The good Lord pardon everyone that prepareth his heart to seek God the Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. Things have not been dealt with heretofore, are being dealt with right here and right now. And the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. And the children of Israel that were present at Jerusalem kept the feast of the unleavened bread seven days with great gladness. Think about what those who didn't come missed out on. And the Levites and the priests praised the Lord day by day, singing with loud instruments unto the Lord. And Hezekiah spake comfortably unto all the Levites that taught the good knowledge of the Lord. And they did eat throughout the feast seven days, offering peace offerings and making confession to the Lord God of their fathers. I want you to underline the expression there in verse 22. And Hezekiah spake comfortably unto all the Levites. Now they were teaching the good knowledge of God, the Word of God. No matter what celebrations we have, no matter what rejoicing we have, we need more than just a stirring of the heart and the mind. We need a firm foundation to stand upon when things are not being celebrated in our lives, when things are dire and dark. We need the Word of the Lord that gives us the hope and the help and the strength that we need. And so the Bible says that Hezekiah the king spake comfortably unto them. The word comfortably here has the thought of he spoke heart to heart. It was not just some formal presentation or speech. He spoke tenderly, tenderly to them heart to heart. He said, now let me tell you about the goodness of God. Let me tell you about the promise of His Word. And it encouraged those who were teaching others to do likewise, to take heart. We're living a day to where we need to be reassuring one another in what we're doing for Him 
and the sufficiency of his word. Let me ask you a question. Are you a reassuring person? Do you take big things and make them smaller or small things and make them bigger? Do you help heal others and bring hope and reassurance to them and their spirit? Or do you take a wound and make it deeper and hurt much worse? I mean, what kind of spirit do you have? That's really the heart of this thing. It's the heart and the spirit. We can talk all day long about who people are and where they've been and what they've done and what they deserve or not. You know, if any of us got what we deserve today, we wouldn't be here. We definitely wouldn't be on our way to heaven, right? We know that God has shown great mercy to us, and in showing great mercy to us, he said unto the merciful, that will show himself merciful. God says, follow my example, and as you show mercy on others, then you're going to have that mercy come back from them to you, but also from God to you. But if you're exacting If you're someone that is forward in your heart and your spirit, that means your heart is turned aside from God, turned aside from his mercy. If that's the way you treat people, then God has designed life in such a way that we reap what we sow. What you mete out to others is coming back to you one day. Be careful exacting upon others. Be careful making them, in your mind, pay for their wrong. None of us, can put ourselves in the place of God. None of us can stand in his stead. That's why Jesus said in the Beatitudes that we're to judge not lest you be judged. That doesn't mean we can't judge righteous judgment. We can't discern things and make proper conclusions based upon what is right and wrong. But the Bible says when it comes to judging someone's heart, you're in no place to do so. You're not God. Man looketh on the outward appearance because that's all he can see. He can only see who we are outwardly and and circumstantially. But God looketh upon the heart. Only God can see the heart. And the heart is what God is looking for. And the heart is what matters most. David had his faults and his failures, but he still was a man after God's own heart. Where's your heart today before God? Where is your heart before others? What is your attitude and spirit toward them? Only God is the judge. And shall not the judge of all the earth do right? We know that he will. God will deal with sin that we refuse to in our lives or in other people in their lives. God will call that into account one day. But in the meantime, God wants us to take heart and take hold of his promise and to have this kind of reassuring, hopeful spirit pointing people to the one who can give the help that we all need. And they were a people that hadn't worshipped God and served him for a long, long time. And here the king, rather than reproving them and reminding them, you know, it's been a long time. I I can't even believe y'all are here. I mean, goodness, I hope this lasts, you know, I've got my doubts. We'll just see how it goes. I mean, I've dealt with some of y'all, and I know how fickle you can be. And so, I hope we can keep this going. If so, that'd be nice, but if not, hey, at least we tried. What kind of leadership is that? Isn't that the way many people look at life and talk to each other day to day? Always the doubt, the fault, the negative, the potential harm, or coming apart or unglued. That's not the way Hezekiah spoke. He spoke in such a way, the Bible says clearly, specifically, he spake comfortably unto the Levites. He was reassuring to them. He spoke heart to heart to them. It was not a facade It was genuine and real from the heart. And by the way, people want to know that about us. Are we real? When we speak, do we speak in sincerity? Are we genuine in what we say? 
Or are we just someone who says what we think needs to be said or what people want to hear us say? It is possible to speak the truth, right? Sometimes the truth does hurt. But it doesn't hurt as bad when we speak it in love. As the Bible says, speak the truth in love with a heart for God, with a heart for that person, that even if they've erred or stumbled, they'll get back up. They'll get it right. They'll make it right. Giving them room to make it right even. A space of grace that God gives to us all. That's what God wants us to give to one another. Look with me over in chapter 32. It's amazing. Here they are in chapter 30, a time of rejoicing, a celebration. The house of God is open. God is in his house with his people and they're with him. They are with him there as well. And so it's a time of great victory and celebration, but life is not always the celebration times. It's the times of trouble and trial and even war that we find in chapter 32 where The king of Assyria, Sennacherib, had come against Judah. King Hezekiah and the people, they were being challenged by a formidable foe, one who had defeated every other nation he had attacked, one who would rail upon them and even their God and say that these nations' gods were not able to protect them from me and your God will not protect you from me either. I'm not only coming after you, but you might as well mark it down. It's as though I already have you. There's no hope for you. And I like as this unfolds what you read here. The Bible says that Hezekiah took counsel. He collaborated. He got input and feedback. And there were those that stepped up to help him. And they began to gather people together. And they were not doing this in a fretful, fearful way. But the Bible says he strengthened himself. He put himself in a position in verse 5 to do his part, what he would be called upon as the king and the people in the face of this legitimate, vital threat. And he set captains of war over the people, gathered them together to him in the street of the gate of the city. And what did he do? He spake comfortably to them. There it is again, heart to heart. He gave them reassurance. Here's what he said. Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed. For the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. For there be more with us than with him. With him is the arm of the flesh, but with us, is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people did what? They rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Now, if someone had to respond to your words to him or her, would they be able to respond with rest and reassurance? Or would you compound the fear, the futility, the frustration? Would you be one who would speak comfortably to others to point them to God, to even quote scripture and to bring reassurance into their lives in face of a great challenge? We need leadership in this hour, in our homes, our churches, our communities, our state, our country. We need those to step up who have a confidence in God who can point us to him knowing that our hope is still in the true and living God of heaven, the Lord God Jehovah, the self-existent one. He doesn't depend upon anyone or anything for his existence. He is because he said, I am, I am, I am. I am the great I am. Isn't that wonderful? I like that. He is because he said, I am. Now, when you think about it, that's where we're at in this hour in our country. There's a lot of confusion, angst, division, but we still have a God. We still have the promises of his word. We can still pray. We can still work together. We can still rise up and do our part, right? 
There's a God in heaven who will show us mercy, who will bring us reassurance, and who will guide us, he will keep us. But I think it's interesting here, the Bible says, as he pointed people to the Lord, the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. I'll never forget when 9-11 happened. And I remember that day, just in horror, watching that unfold and those towers collapse. And I remember even when we had our next service in the church and uh, we met and we had chapel and we had some other things, the people began to speak how much it meant to them when I came to the pulpit with words of reassurance and encouragement that we have a God who is with us. This will not defeat us as a nation, as a people. We will rally, we will rise up, and we will rise above. And that is what we did. People humbled themselves. They drew nigh to God and each other, and they rallied together. I want to tell you, dear friend, that's the hour in which we live right now. It's time for us to rally to gather, to humble ourselves, to seek God, to do our part, but just to take heart and know that God's grace is sufficient and he will not fail us. I'm here to tell you today, there is a God in heaven who is with you, who is for you, who is working on your behalf, for he said he is in the promise of his word. I think about these great promises. Look with me over here in Joshua chapter 1. I love just seeing the promises of God that he gives us in his holy word. Joshua chapter 1. As Moses had passed off the scene, God raised up Joshua to lead his people into the land of promise. And so God says to his servant Joshua in verse number 5, Joshua 1, there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very wholeheartedly, vehemently even, very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Isn't that wonderful? I imagine if the God of heaven gave me that charge right before we took a step forward, I'd be ready to go. Wouldn't you? God says, now I'm with you. Everywhere you go, I'm going to go with you. There's nowhere you will go that I am not going with you or that I am not already there. Praise God for that. I will tell you, as I think about the promise of God, I think about the Word of God. That's what Hezekiah, when the Levites were teaching the people the Word of God anew, and they were rejoicing in the Lord, he said, let's put our hope in God in the promise of His Word. When trouble came, he reassured them, and he gave them the Word of the Lord again, and people rested themselves on that. They said, we're just going to rest in the Lord. I remember someone one day making a statement to me about a need that was before us and asked me, what are you going to do about it, Pastor? And I said, well, we're just going to have to trust the Lord. We're just going to have to rest on his promises. And we did. And God proved faithful. Aren't you thankful that God has proved faithful to you? Oh, he's done it in my lifetime and time again. Look with me over in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 41 a precious promise here. 
The Bible says in verse 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed. That means to be worn down, wearied over a period of time, to be brought to confusion, dismayed. You just, it doesn't compute anymore. It doesn't make sense. You're losing heart, motivation, confidence. He says, now be not dismayed. Why? For I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Verse 13, for I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, fear not, I will help thee. Fear not, verse 14, thou worm Jacob and ye men of Israel, I will help thee, saith the Lord, my Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Isn't that wonderful? God says again and again, Yes, I know you're not sufficient. You know you're not sufficient. But I'll tell you what, I am. And I will not fail you. This is a promise God made to his people then. And he wrote it down in his word that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. If God did it for them, he'll do it for us. He said, I will help you. That's what he told Joshua. Underline that. Some of us today, it's like, Lord, I need something. Lord, I need some help. God says, I will help you. I will put someone, something in your path to give you hope, to give you help, to give you the direction you need at this juncture to come alongside of you and make a way where there is no way. I will help you. Turn with me over to the New Testament book of 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians, I want you to find your place here. These are some promises I want you to take with you this week. 2 Corinthians, as I read this in chapter 1, notice verse 4, speaking of the God of all comfort, the Father of mercies, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are are comforted of God. God comforts us and then uses us to reassure is the word there to encourage someone else. God is reaching out to you today. God is trying to reassure you, remind you of his promise, his presence. He says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will help thee. He said, I am a God that you can count on a God who will come through. Now, as I help you, I want you to look then to help someone else, you see. What kind of reassurer are you? We all need it, right? Well, God is trying to reassure your heart today. Will you reassure someone else? Have you ever noticed some people are really easygoing, easy to work with, and agreeable, willing some people are more disagreeable, take exception, difficult to work with. I don't know what your nature, spirit, or personality is, but I'll tell you, some things are what they are. But our goal and our standard, our example, is Jesus Christ. And wherever you are on the spectrum of personality, you can have him develop his spirit within you by the Holy Spirit more and more. Do you have that spirit of helping someone? Come alongside of them. Are you grateful for what others do for you or do you just kind of dismiss it? Do you expect it? Do you think they owe it to you? What is your spirit the spirit of Jesus Christ was to glorify his father and to do his will. His spirit was to give his life a ransom for many. He didn't come to get or to take. He came to give, to serve. Oh, what an example Christ is. And God says, now I'm going to comfort you, reassure, encourage you, and I want you to go and encourage someone else. I hope you're encouraged by this message today. I hope God will strengthen you. Look over in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. The Bible teaches us in verse 14 this matter of needs being met and our giving to God. It says, but by an equality, 
that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. Now think about it. He says right now God is encouraging you, reassuring you, helping you. Well, he wants you to help someone else. It may just be in conversation, in prayer, in word, some way, but it may be in some tangible way as well to help them financially to meet a need that they have. God says, now, if you're able to do that, do it as unto the Lord because the time will come when you're in need and they can turn around and help you. Have you ever noticed that? We say it all the time, you can't outgive the Lord. That's true. God takes care of you. And you give and you give and you give and then all of a sudden one day you've got a need and God puts them in someone's heart to help you. I'll tell you, he's an on-time God is what I've learned. My brother said that he had a need years ago. That's when he was working for the DMV and as an officer, you know, riding around, weighing trucks and things like that. And uh, he said that he was in a cafeteria One day, and just burden, Lord, where are you? What's going on? He said he walked out after he finished his meal, walked down the sidewalk. A man he had never seen before or seen since walked by him, put his finger in his chest, and simply said, he's an on-time God. And walked on. And my brother said, that's exactly what I needed. I thought, Lord, help me to trust you. Help me to trust you, Lord. And you know what? God blessed him, and God came through. I remember walking down the stairwell of the parking deck at what was Carolina's Medical Center, you know, years ago here uh, in Charlotte. I think about all the different transition, how it's grown, Atrium Health today. But think about what God was doing in my life that day I could still see it was so cold, you know. And uh, I was talking and just freezing in that stairwell. And I walking down the stairwell, I said, Lord, I need something. Please help me, Lord. And I walked in. I was going to the heart unit there. And I walked past a pastor friend. And he looked at me and he was talking to some folks. And I said, hey, brother, how you doing? He said, good. He looked at the folks. He said, hey, excuse me, could you give me a moment? And he said, brother, Cruz, could I talk to you a second? I said, sure. He called me over into the corner of the hall. I could still see it. And he looked at me, and a tear came down his cheek. Now, remember, I just said, God, I need something. Please help me, Lord. Just somehow reassure my heart today. It's a tear. He said, Brother Cruz, I don't know what you're going through right now, but God has put you on my heart. And I want you to know I've been praying for you. And boy, about that time, I'm thinking, wow, what's the odds of this? That was what I needed. But he didn't stop there. He said something that I've never forgotten and never will. This was years ago. He said, I've been praying earnestly for you. And he said, and I feel like God wants me to say this to you. And I'm thinking, wow, what's that? What next? He said, God has a work for you there at Shining Light. And God will bless you. I feel like the Lord wanted me to say this to you. It's yours to keep and it's yours to lose. That was almost a mild reproof in a good way. Because it wasn't just an encouragement but a reassurance to the point to where it's like God will do his part, but remember, you must do yours. I'm telling you, God has blessing in store for you and for your family. You can trust him to do his part. Will he be able to trust us to do our part? To take him at his word. I close with this one passage in 1 Thessalonians. Just look there quickly. 1 Thessalonians how God's word is powerful, chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14. Now we exhort, that means to plead with, to strongly encourage you, brethren. Warn them that are unruly. Comfort, there it is, reassure, encourage. 
the feeble-minded. Now, the feeble-minded, that's not a word for someone who is not intelligent, someone who is not able mentally. The word there means someone who is weak in their thoughts. They're weary. They're depressed. They're discouraged. There's a feebleness that is set in in their thoughts, and they're afraid. You know what he says to do to people like that? Don't kick them when they're down. Don't tell them they're getting what they deserve. Don't tell them how bad they are on top of what they're facing right now. You come alongside of them, the one who has been encouraged right, encourage them on Christ's behalf. Reassure, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. God wants us to follow that which is good, which is right. Don't render evil for evil, but return good for evil, and ever follow that which is good and right before God. As God has encouraged you, He wants to and will use you to encourage and comfort someone else. I believe God's Word is true. Do you believe it? And as God has given us a reminder of His presence, a reminder of His promise of help and strength, as He helps us, and He will, may He count on us to help others and reassure Him with that same spirit.